welcome to this edition of the Talk of Simsbury. My name is Dominique Avery. Today, the Talk of Simsbury is the announcement by the state that a site in Simsbury was chosen as one of the four places for the location of a medical marijuana production facility. Here in town, the reaction to the news has varied from quiet interest all the way to outrage from some local residents who predict it will ruin the town's reputation. I've invited three guests today to talk about what this is all about and what it will actually mean for our community. Simsbury Town Planner Jaime Peck, and from Curaleaf, Chief Operating Officer April Arasate and Eileen Konechny. Did I get it right? You did. This has been really the talk of the town. Sometimes I say something's the talk of the town, but I have to say this has really been the talk of the town. <laughs> And uh, one of the, I've been listening to people talk, and one of the uh, things that people most want to know about is where is this facility going to be? I think they have in mind, you know, it's like a little suburban house with grow lights and uh, marijuana plants in the, in the living room or something or in the garage. So where is it going to be? I, I know they talked about um, someplace near the high school. Just tell me a little bit about where it's going to be. Right. Um, well, I can assure you that it's not going to be someone's garage. <laughs> um, we are located at 100 Grist Mill. It was formerly a high-tech manufacture facility. Um, it currently has existing infrastructure in there for high-tech manufacture. There are, one of the reasons we chose the facility is it's equipped with eight clean rooms. And, you know, we're really, you know, we're growing cannabis, but this is a pharmaceutical company, so we're pharmaceutical production, and the clean room space was very attractive to us for that reason. Um, if you don't know where 100 Grist Mill is, it's in, it's w behind Mill Rights. Um, it's not visible from the road. I know that there has been some concern that it's close to the high school. Oh, that's what I was going to ask you. It's one of the things that people ask all the time. God, it's so close to the high school. How can you do that? Right, and I will, I will say, um, one of the requirements when we submitted our application to the state was to show um, a 1,000 foot radius around the facility and that nothing within that 1,000 foot radius was a school, a church, um, a park. Um, so we, we were very cognizant of where it was and the location of the schools and you know we really followed the guidelines that were set by the state. In addition, I think what would ease some people's fears is that this is not a dispensary. So there will be no public, no, no public entry to this facility. We, you know, we'll have around 20 to 25 employees coming in and out of there. But apart from that, the goal is to just disappear. Nobody will know we were, th were there. And, and, no, and you, you, it's almost impossible. I did try and find it, and it's almost impossible to find it. I never had any idea th that there was even a building there. Most people don't, and right. that was, you know, that was the goal. So um, the reaction from um, to, uh, kids at the high school I heard from parents was sort of great excitement about, you know, oh my God, you know, this is going to be marijuana growing in Simsbury. But your facility is, um, th there's going to be a tremendous amount of security. Uh, and so how, how do you envision this? Well, part of that, I mean, I hate to let the kids down. <laughs> But, you know, again, they're, they're really not going to know anything that's happening up there. Um, the security is, was a huge part of our application, and, you know, the entire perimeter of the area is going to be fenced. We have two guards on site 24-7, 365 days a year, um, extensive uh, security surveillance, uh, alarm systems. I mean, nobody will be getting into that facility. Um, especially high school children, <laughs> but um, also, you know, as part of our, as part of our program, as part of our understanding that, you know, maybe this changes the way kids view cannabis. Um, we've really set it. We've set aside a percentage of our sales to kind of go towards um, not only education, um, but substance abuse prevention, as well as just educating the children about just because something is available as a prescription drug doesn't mean it's a safe drug to use. And really, you know, they face the same, it's the same problem that we have now with uh, 
Oxycontin in the cabinets and um, Percocets and things that are available over by prescription that need to be um, people need to understand that these are not they're not safe just because they are available by prescription. So it's we, interesting we that you brought that up because um, it, as we're taping this yesterday there was um, uh, an event at the state capitol with people who are totally opposed to mm -hmm. uh, legalizing marijuana and they're they were sort of saying it's a gateway and it's going to change how young people feel about it. Uh, so it's I'm sure that you have taken that into account. Yes, we've actually met with several um, substance abuse centers and tried to understand their concerns and that was one of their bigger concerns is that you know children now will have a different perception of this and we want to make sure we address that and um, that everyone's comfortable. Okay so um, we'll probably get back into mm -hmm. that a little bit later but let me uh, address a question to Hiram um, Peck who is the town planner and um, you were uh, involved in, in the location of this from the beginning. Uh, another question that people in town have wondered about is that other towns um, immediately after the law was passed in 2012 passed a moratorium on a facility like this and that didn't happen in Simsbury and I'm interested in what was it brought up and then the second question I want to get to is there I have heard from people in public meetings actually say how come this only came before the Zoning Commission? Mm -hmm. So let's let's start with the moratorium issue. Sure, a couple of questions. The town from time to time has considered um, moratoria when various issues have come up. Um, in this case, uh, after the law was passed and became effective in October of 2012, uh, I did take uh, the, the issue to the Zoning Commission because that's the commission, the way our, our organization are set up here, that would in fact have to uh, adopt a regulation if one was going to be adopted. And the commission discussed that in 2012, and they decided to have a public hearing. And this, uh, there were a series of regulations, and this regulation was part of that process. Um, there really was no public input or public interest. I think I even filmed a short piece here uh, at SCTV to talk about it and say we'd like your input into this process. Um, so the commission talked about it, and at that time there was no real interest um, one way or the other with regard to either endorsing a facility or f prohibiting one. Um, some other towns, which West Hartford and some others, have in fact um, chosen to enact moratorium. And I think basically to study the issue further, we actually studied, studied it as soon as the law was passed. And so we had a year to look at this before uh, this issue sort of came up. We knew what was going on. We pay attention to what gets passed and we wanted to see whether the law that was being passed was a reasonable one that we could work with. Uh, and so I presented to the commission at that time a series of things, the definition of a production facility, the definition of a distribution facility, and then potentially some locations where they could be located in town. No residential zones, certainly. A distribution facility, if one ever were proposed, would have to be in a commercial zone. Um, this particular zone is an industrial zone, and that would be allowed for a production facility. But at the time, the commission thought about it for a long time, and they actually extended the hearing for people to come and talk about it. There was still no public interest in it, really. We heard from very few people about it. And so ultimately, about a year later, I think in the fall of 2013, when Curleaf came in and said, we'd like to make an informal presentation about a site we have in mind in town, um, they did that, and the commission became interested, and they said they were very interested in the professional uh, presentation that was made, the factual presentation, the scientifically based information that was presented by Eileen. Um, so then the commission said, well, we'll, we'll consider it. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, they came back with their attorney and said, we'd like to know whether you would like to approve this or not approve this. We're not forcing you. They did never pressure the town at all. And the commission decided to adopt their regulation to allow these facilities. And so that's the process that we went through, very deliberative process. There was a public hearing on the regulation itself. And nobody came. Very few people came. I think at the last hearing we had one person speak one and he person spoke and about a... And he didn't speak, I mean, but there wasn't an outcry. SCTV cameras were there. That's correct. Right? That's correct. We, we were very transparent about the whole process and uh, we, we talked to uh, several of the commissions about it, um, referred to regulation as required to do by statutes, and there was really no, no outcry about it at that time either. So uh, I think that if people would look at the file and look at the facts and, as April said, sort of change your view about, at least be open-minded about what's being proposed here and the security measures that are in place here and what the use of the, the substance will be ultimately when it's produced. 
um, I think that they, they may at least get a, a good, a different view of it. Okay, uh, one more question I want to address to you because you're the town planner mm -hmm. and you're a representative of the town government. Um, what do you anticipate the economic impact on the positive side to be uh, for the town and um, projected t uh, revenues for the town? Sure. Well, I can tell you that when the presentation was made to the commission, uh, the applicant was very open with the fact that about $2 million will go into the facility to create the facility to get it to the standard that they need it to be with regard to security and internal renovations of the building. So that's obviously a plus from the economic side. I'm certainly not the assessor, and the assessor could give you better answers to the exact number, but it's a positive uh, economic impact in that regard as well. Uh, I think ultimately what will happen is that um, in the first phase, as I understand it, there are probably about 20 jobs that will be available. Um, subsequent phases may have, may have more, maybe 30 jobs. Um, so the, the business that's there now in that particular building is, is only using part of that building anyway. They will be relocated somewhere else, hopefully in town. Um, and then this facility will um, be, uh, have, have a new life and, and hopefully an expanded use in the future and continue to be an economic advantage to the town. And, and uh, as a town planner, have you gotten much reaction? I've heard something. Have people actually picked up the phone and called positively or negatively? Yeah, I actually, um, out of the out of the people that I usually hear from, I, I've heard of from two people actually that have called up with with concerns about it. Um, some people may have concerns and they may not have called. I certainly understand that. Um, there are other people that are positive and they haven't called as well. But overwhelmingly, the response uh, when things are very controversial, for example, a few years ago when there was a Target store presented in town, uh, people made no secret about what their concerns were at that point in time, and that they were very vocal about that. At this point in time, uh, with this particular facility, as I said, I've, I've heard from two people that were negative uh, about it. So it's not been overwhelmingly negative at all. And in fact, I think significant majority of people have been positive about it. Let me now turn to Eileen. Uh, you are the president of Cure Relief, yes. and I read that you were an oncology nurse um, for um, 20 years or so, yes. and um, I think you perhaps were the driving force behind this, behind Cure Relief. Am I wrong? No, uh, I, 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 I was, and I'll cry. <laughs> <laughs> it's very personal and emotional for her, based on you know the years of years of oncology. So I've been an oncology nurse for over 20 years. I have lost. Sorry. It's okay. April, you want to pick it yeah. up? Yeah. It's uh, so the, I, discuss, the discussion of, of um, medical marijuana is uh, incredibly emotional. I watched mm -hmm. it at the Capitol, people coming up and testifying because it really is a, a very personal thing when, when you need. So maybe and, yeah, step I, in for Eileen yeah, at the moment. Absolutely. So as you can imagine, you know, in 20 years being an oncology nurse, um, you know, she really got, you're dealing with this every day right. you know people dying people every dying, day right. and it's extremely emotional in addition Eileen lost her mother and sister to cancer um, I actually lost my mother to breast cancer three years ago which is how we ended up together so right. it's a very personal and emotional um, project for us you know she sees the need for this and has seen it work has seen people have their lives changed even no matter even if they just have a short time left the quality of life is so great and the science behind it for some of the other qualifying conditions is remarkable you know it's life changing for a lot of people for epilepsy um, glaucoma for PTSD MS. so so yeah. so um, being able to to take the regulations that the state put forward and require, you know, standardized dosing and, and testing of medicine to be able to provide this to people. And I know the need is so significant and be a part of that, to be able to change somebody's life is amazing. The safety profile of cannabis is, is unlike many of the pharmaceuticals that are out there. And, and, and we're, we're humbled. Yeah, and really what is great about Connecticut, the regulations in Connecticut, is the way they've set it up, they really have, they really have defined it 
as a pharmaceutical. I mean, this gives us the greatest opportunity. Eileen's been an activist for the past over five years, um, and seeing the different states go into effect, Connecticut really wanted to make a pharmaceutical out of this, and that is what's so exciting um, for us that we can really put it into familiar forms. So somebody who maybe has a, there's a stigma associated with cannabis or is cannabis naive, as we call it sometimes, um, wouldn't be afraid to maybe take a pill or, or, or use an inhaler or... or right. Or use a or or have it in a tincture so they could put some drops in of it into their tea and and feel the effects and and it works. I've seen it work. And part of what we do, I mean, in some cases, you can reduce the psychoactive component to a degree that it's, you almost don't feel anything. But now all the other cannabinoids that are beneficial can be delivered to your system without this psychoactive effect. So our product line is very diverse and really allows for a lot of different, um, specifically targets a lot of different qualifying conditions. One of the things that I heard uh, Governor Malloy say in the news conference that announced the four locations of these uh, cannabis production facilities was, our regulations are tougher than any, any others yeah. and we are not going down the road of California mm -hmm. and certainly <clears throat> not Colorado. It's absolutely true. The the. Uh, the hurdles that had to be met to 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 do what the state has has said, it's it's unlike any other state so far. And we would like I, I would love to see this as a model for medical cannabis across the country because the patients deserve it. The patients deserve it. So I mean that I think is some. What, what did you call them, um, marijuana naive or cannabis, cannabis naive. naive? Yeah. I mean I think we um, many of us have no understanding of the difference that cannabis can make for pain uh, management. So can you tell I, me a little I, bit about I it? Tell our the, audience a little bit about it's it. It's really interesting. The majority of the patients that I get to speak to are probably over fifty years old and haven't really have an experience of marijuana other than perhaps using it in their younger years and it's and it's not the same and and delivery systems are certainly not the same either um, pain isn't one of the qualifying conditions in Connecticut um, but um, multiple sclerosis is and and of course cancer and a lot and many cancer patients deal with horrible amounts of pain um, but because it's cannabis and it works differently than any other medicine that's out there because the science behind this is, and I'm gonna try and get it as concise as I can, is that we have an endocannabinoid system in our bodies and that is relatively new science. Um, THC was first synthesi synthesized back in 1964, but they didn't really understand why it worked until the early 1990s when they discovered that we actually have receptors in our bodies that work with this. And then the idea was if we have a receptor in our body that actually works with THC, well, that's kind of funny. Why is that? So they discovered that we make our own endogenous cannabinoids and that's why it happens to work that way. And so for the conditions that we have, especially for MS and, and epilepsy, you know, they find that cannabinoids, these cannabinoids work specifically good for how it needs to, how, what it needs to do. And it works like, it doesn't work like any other pharmaceutical medicine that's out there. It's a plant, it's a plant, it's a plant-based medicine. It's a, and it's, and it's the whole plant that makes it work so well because there hasn't been a lot of research on it because of the politics behind it and into the prohibition and all of that, um, the research right now is just beginning. And, and we hope to take that a whole lot further. Yeah, that's that, a big that's, part of that's our- That's a big part of what we're doing. That's a big part of why we wanted to be involved with this because, because the, the, the possibilities are, are amazing. It's exciting. I'd like to take a step back and uh, just go back to the facility mm -hmm. and describe a little bit uh, what that facility is going to look like. Um, are you're growing plants and um, you're going to produce something from those plants. How is that going to work? 
Yeah, sure. So, so the exterior of the building won't change much. Um, the interior, you know, obviously we're going to have cultivation areas, um, and then a big part of our process will be processing. You know, so what you do is you grow the plant, and then you isolate those um, cannabinoids. the cannabinoids. You isolate them into concentrates, and then you use those concentrates to make a, a host of products. So, so you're going be, to have a, uh, I'm, I'm going yep, to be totally so naive, you're going to have a, a grow room? Yeah, several grow rooms as it goes through the different with stages. With grow lights? With grow cool. lights, yep, um, a curing curing process that we'll go through, um, and then a processing area. And processing and facility. The closer okay. we get to a finished product um, is when we move into those clean rooms because we want to make sure that we are handling this as a pharmaceutical every step of the way. Um, in addition, we will have a separate area that is committed to R&D, um, and that's where we hope a lot of the exciting Research science and, and medicine will come, will come out of. And the other thing that, that the people of Simsbury really should know is that anything that leaves the facility is a packaged product, packaged and sealed product, ready for sale at a licensed dispensary throughout the state. So it's not that there's but in a jar that's going somewhere, mm -hmm. this is a packaged product that's sealed specifically that can be purchased by a patient who has a qualifying condition and a, and a card that can get into a dispensary to purchase this product. And in so, addition, we have, we have software that gives us the capability to track each gram seed to sale. Okay, so that, that's, that's what I wanted to know about because I, passed, I was at a Chamber of Commerce meeting this morning mm -hmm. and I passed around um, a, my clipboard with a sheet of, and I said, write down, if you have any questions, write them down. And one of them was, how will you ensure that the product stays in-house? Yeah, diversion so tell was, me more about that. Diversion was a, was a large concern, obviously, mm -hmm. and a big part of our application. And um, there is software on the market that exists that allows us to track each gram from seed to sale. Um, at any moment, we know where that gram is and where it's located. It's, it's really incredible. It's really incredible. So the plants will be tagged, and as they go through their process, they have to go, they'll, they'll hit little benchmarks that they have to, and then so the plants will be weighed, and all of these mm -hmm. things will be monitored. So you will know, you know, this capsule is going to come from this batch, and the plants from that batch were this plant, this plant, this plant, and this plant. So we're, we're really excited. And you uh, mentioned before that your interest is in R&D and you're not particularly in favor of uh, the smoking version of it, that you'd rather describe a little bit the different kind of ways that marijuana and, or cannabis can be used for uh, medically. So um, s smoked cannabis, nobody ever really likes to recommend smoke smoking anything. Um, so um, our raw plant material will be available for patients and we'll have a, a big educational push on, you know, the use of vaporizers and, and what that is is just, um, it's, a, it's an implement that heats up the plant material to below the, combust to the combustion temperature so that the cannabinoids, which is the part that works, are, are heated up into this mist and then that's inhaled. Um, that's actually one of the, it's the fastest form of delivery. And for somebody who's nauseous, especially a cancer patient who happens to be nauseous and can't even swallow a pill, let alone a sip of water, um, it really has, I've seen it do amazing things in, in enabling patients to continue eating, which is a wonderful thing. Um, other delivery, uh, other delivery forms would be um, in the form of, of tinctures, which is just um, plant material mixed into um, uh, another either uh, glycerin or, or or an alcohol substance, and then the cannabinoids are put into that, and and you can drop it under your tongue, and you can get quick relief that way as well or put into a capsule and then it takes a little bit longer to work. Each different delivery method is, has a specific onset of action and half-life and those different kinds of things. And that gets personal to the patient depending on what their issues are and what they're trying to combat. But. I want to bring the question back. We, we're almost out of time. Um, I'm going to give you each a chance to summarize the thing that you want people to take away from this. But why Simsbury? Why did you end up uh, coming here? 
we, we didn't have a moratorium. We learned that from Hiram. Uh, you, you just looked for the uh, building or? I can, uh, really, it was the facility that brought us here to begin with, but when Eileen and I were looking for locations, it was important to us to find a town that would embrace us. You know, we didn't want to be the bad guys. We wanted people to understand, you know, a large part of our marketing campaign, a large part of our, our whole business plan is about education, and we wanted to be able to be embraced by a town and have them be proud to have us there because we are proud of what we're doing. So that mattered, and when, when Hiram mentioned that we came and we, we asked them to look into this um, for this particular facility, you know, we really, we really asked. We wanted to know. We had several, you know, other facilities that we were looking at as well, and we, we wanted to know that we would be welcomed. So that was a big part of it. And what was your reaction there? I think there were 16 applicants who applied mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. licenses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction, and how did you learn that you had been selected? Um, as you can imagine, we cried a lot. <laughs> we laughed a lot. We we screamed a little bit. <laughs> we screamed a lot. We were we were extremely happy. You know, as I mentioned, it was very personal to us. We we believe that, you know, we're here for a reason, and so we were. There was a lot of tears, um, and we found out, you know, the night before, the press conference, and yes. I think that brings up a really interesting question. Okay, so we're now in, we've got two minutes left, so yeah. I, we're now in the summation okay. for each one of you to say shortly what it is that you want people to understand about this project. Sure. I was just going to say, and just sort of along with your last question, there were 16 applicants, and I think that indicates a significant level of competition. Two reasons, I think. One is economic development. Uh, I think that has a lot to do with potential economic development. I think the other thing is that people realize that, that there really is a new way to look at this particular substance. Um, in addition to the economic development, the potential for it doing some real good with the things that have listed in the state law is a real possibility. Mm -hmm. So we're, as far as I know, we're, we're happy to have them. We hope it works out really well. We're going to do everything we possibly can to make sure that that's, that's done safely and in accordance with the, the regulations of the town and the state. You did a great job summing that up. Yeah. <laughs> and I would just, I would just like people we're to know that we're, um, that we're, we're trans if anyone has any questions, we're happy to, to answer, to talk. Yeah. If, if there's any concerns, we're Is here. Is there some place they can reach you if they have a, if, can you yes, give a phone number? Yes, I'm April at cureleaf.com. I and I'm Eileen at cureleaf.com. And then if you can't remember that, if you reach out to Hiram, Hiram's been great at sending stuff our way. Yeah. Wonderful, and maybe Thank we'll you. have you back again. Anytime. That'll be great. So, uh, as I said, our time is up. Uh, thanks to everyone here at SCTV for helping us get this show on the air, and to my guests for uh, their participation, and thank you for joining us. And if you still want more details, you can actually go to our website and see the October 7th Zoning Commission meeting where Cure Relief made their first public presentation. You can also see the public hearing that Hiram mentioned earlier on Cure Relief's proposal. And finally, you can watch CTN's coverage of the entire announcement of Cure Relief's selection as one of the four marijuana production facilities in the state, either on our website at simsburytv.org or on CTN at ct-n.com. I'm Dominique Avery. See you next time for the Talk of Simsbury. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.